Hi, I'm Mike, and uh, welcome back to the shop. In this episode, episode number two of our build series for this 30cc sport plane, we're going to start working on the fuselage and making all of the jigs and templates that we need to cut the parts to assemble the fuselage, uh, ultimately once we get them made. So, uh, let's get started on looking at the things that we're going to need to make. Obviously, there's a top, bottom, and, and sides uh, to this fuselage, and they're all made out of 1 8 light fly. Uh, there's also a doubler in here that doubles this section of the fuselage, which is where uh, most of the strain is. Most planes do that. Uh, there's also five formers. One is here, 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 and there. Uh, and they are what add the rigidity to the box style construction. So to make the tops and the bottoms and the sides, uh, we use these templates uh, on the router table very easy to do. We're going to make these templates here in just a little bit. Uh, this is the template for the doubler that, that makes that part that goes there. And here's an example of a, uh, a top piece that's made out of light fly that we've used the uh, templates to cut out. And that obviously will we'll just glue into this section here. Now we'll also want to build a jig that holds everything straight while we're gluing the fuselage parts up. Uh, the jig is just simply a uh, piece of scrap MDF, uh, medium density fiber board with a, a block on the end of it that has two 1 8 grooves cut in it that will hold that 1 8 plywood perfectly perpendicular to the base. Uh, and that helps keep everything nice and straight and, and registered out while we're gluing it up. Uh, not, again, not at all hard to make. Uh, the dimensions are not exact except for the width, of course. Uh, and again, we'll go through this here in just a minute and, and make a new jig. Uh, you may be asking yourself by now, why in the world would I remake all of these parts uh, if I've already got them? Uh, well, one of the uh, beautiful things about designing and, and making your own planes is that if you see something you want to modify along the way, uh, it's easy enough to do. The jigs are easy to make, the material, the MDF is cheap, uh, and of course the light fly is cheap as well. Uh, although this sport plane flies very, very well, uh, and that's an example of it right there, uh, it flies well with a 35cc. Uh, it is three and three quarters of an inch wide on the front of the firewall here. Uh, it will accept a DLE 35, but it is awfully tight. An RCGF fits right on, uh, but a DLE is very tight. Uh, if you recall, uh, two of the standoffs on a DLE 35 are a little bit wider apart than the other two. So uh, I'm going to extend this fuselage out by exactly a half an inch quarter on either side, and that'll even let us put a 50cc a DLE 55 or a DA 50, whichever you want to put on there, or whatever. Uh, for those of us that just can't seem to go fast enough. So, uh, to accomplish that, I will need to uh, widen, and this is the bottom template here, I'll need to widen that bottom template by a quarter of an inch on either side. Uh, and while I'm at it, uh, I'm going to raise the height of the fuselage half inch, and I don't know that that's gonna do anything for me um, other than that will give me a little bit more height in the back uh, to have room for the uh, rudder uh, hinge that goes in the back back here. Uh, I don't really have a room problem now, but it'd be nice to have an extra quarter an inch or a half an inch to uh, attach all of that business that needs to go in the back back there. So while I'm at it and making new templates, I'm going to uh, increase the height by a half inch. Uh, and I think that I'm going to even extend the uh, overall length by uh, maybe as much as two inches. I'll leave the uh, wing moment up here exactly where it's at. Uh, in other words, the wing socket I'll leave here. So from here back, I'll extend uh, two inches. Basically, that'll put the tail another two inches further back. And we'll see, the, see what the flight performance difference is. I think it's gonna be a little more stable on long runs uh, and maybe even uh, increase our performance in uh, high alpha flight. So, I'll talk about a few design considerations uh, so that we can get started on those templates. First of all, uh, we need to decide what size wing we're going to put on our 35cc plane. Uh, most 35cc planes are in about the 74-75 uh, inch range, that's, that's wingspan range, and the planes are usually around 60-65 inches long. So they're a little shorter than, than the wings are long. Uh, 
uh, and that's that's pretty much the way this plane here is built. Uh, the first version uh, wing, or the first uh, wing that this plane uses, it uses three. Uh, this is the uh, fun fly wing. Uh, it, it's a, a very basic um, foam core wing. Great for fun fly, great for sport fly. It's a very durable, all round, uh, excellent wing design. Uh, a lot of people call this the Hershey bar design. It's a constant cord, of course, which means it doesn't taper on either the front or the back. And the wing thickness is the same uh, on the root end as it is out on the tip. So uh, it's one of the easiest designs to build and uh, it's an incredibly fun wing to fly. The second version of wing that this exact fuselage runs, uh, and all you have to do is plug it in exactly the same as uh, this wing plugs in, is a uh, leading edge is straight and then there's a taper on the rear and uh, the thickness on the end is, a, is a down about 75% of what it is on the root. So, uh, and then there's a, a third wing which is a very, very, very thin wing. Um, double tapered uh, and extremely thin out on the end and that is to see how fast we can get this plane to go so there's a fun fly wing a um, uh, sport wing much like an edge and then there is a uh, speed wing so each of those will plug onto this plane using the exact same uh, anti-rotation pin the bolt hole and the uh, wing socket so first thing you need to decide is, is what style wing we're going to use in this case uh, obviously it's the fun fly wing and this one happens to be 17 inches total overall length, but we're 13 and three quarters on the root rib, which is what's important for us here. We want to make sure that we leave enough uh, room here, or at least we plan ahead to put the wing socket, the anti-rotation pin, and the bolt hole that holds the wings on. So, a, uh, no, I wouldn't really call it a rule of thumb, but an observation in sport planes is, uh, having to do with where to place this wing uh, forward and back and, and of course up and down uh, is the where the maximum thickness of this wing uh, is placed in relation to the prop. I don't know that there's actually a general rule there. Uh, I have looked through a lot of literature. I'm not a, an aeronautical, aeronautical engineer and one of the great things about designing your own uh, RC planes is you don't have to be an engineer. Uh, just about anything you do will fly, uh, but if you follow some simple rules or observations, it will fly better. And one of the observations that I have noticed is that if you place the thickness of the thickest part of this wing about 30, 31, maybe 32 percent behind the prop, uh, at least that distance between the prop and the hinge line, so we're going to place the thickest part of this wing about 30 to 32 percent uh, along this distance here is measured from the back of the prop to the hinge line then this plane will fly very very well now i have noticed that if i move it forward about three quarters of an inch it still flies just as well if i move it back about three quarters of an inch it still flies just as well now i have moved it up and down uh, as much of an inch uh, and i've actually got a uh, one of them here where i have put multiple wing tube sockets around uh, and in the plane flies very well uh, but I like exactly where I'm putting it here uh, so that's what we're going to do so make sure that we're going to make sure that we need to leave enough meat in other words we're not cutting out lightning holes where we want to put that wing tube socket uh, and we're going to include the bolt hole there and we're going to leave some meat back here in our sides for this anti-rotation pin now, uh, if you notice this pin is sticking out, uh, most planes, most wings will have the uh, anti-rotation pin mounted in the wing root right here. Uh, I like to use adjustable uh, incidents uh, or incidence adjusters as my anti-rotation pin, uh, just because I like to play with the incidence of the plant of the wing. That uh, that means that uh, is if I raise this up and there's a little Allen screw in there that all I have to do is screw it up or down. Uh, if I raise that pin up, I can uh, put some negative incidence in. If I put the pin down, of course, I now have positive incidence. Uh, and I like to play around with it like that just to uh, um, see how the performance of the plane changes. 
So uh, I think that's enough on uh, design considerations. We know where we're going to put our wing, which will tell us where we cannot put lightning holes and where we can put lightning holes. Um, so let's get started cutting those parts out. We've got the blank cut for our template. Uh, our side template is 47 and a half inches long and five and a half inches tall. That adds uh, three quarters of an inch in height to our existing plane and two inches in length. Now we need to decide where we're gonna start this taper and exactly how far we're gonna taper down to. Again, that's uh, uh, the only thing that, that really dictates or, or really ties us down here is how long our wing is. Uh, remember that the, we want to finish the wing root before we start that taper back. Uh, and of course, the turtle deck fits on, on top here to, to finish that out and make it look nice. So, uh, decision is where do we want to put this taper? Because remember, not only does it start tapering down, it starts to taper in uh, that kind of Coke bottle uh, look I've heard some guys, some of the older, uh, older guys describe. So, where do we want to start that? Um, for our existing wing, I have found that 18 and 3 eighths of an inch works well, so why not stay with that? Uh, that way we'll keep the same doubler length there. So we will place our first former at 18 and 3 eighths, uh, which means after that we start our taper. So measure off our 18 and 3 eighths, and you want to get as sharp a pen as you can get or pencil so that your number, your uh, lines are exact. And we are starting that former at 18 3 eighths, not ending it. Remember that former is an eighth thick. So a couple square lines there, just to represent our former so we don't get confused. We're gonna put an eighth inch former right there. Now, from there out is where our taper is gonna be. And uh, since we're adding 3 eighths of an inch, the existing one, just for the heck of it, happened to be two and a half. So now we're actually it was two and a quarter. So now we're three inches. So we're going to come down to three inches tall, which will give us a little more room for that bottom hinge on that rudder. Like I was mentioning before, uh, we have a hinge that goes in here, a Robart style pin hinge, and uh, at two and a quarter. Uh, with the elevator in here that just gave us, um, and we were just a little cramped up right there. So this give us a lot more room, a little more uh, room for error back there, uh, putting that hinge in. So uh, let's put us a straight line from three inches up to our mark at 18 and three eighths and use a straight edge there, just gonna make it Make sure your straight edge is straight. And put a nice crisp line there because we we want to make sure we cut exactly to it. It's not so uh, not so important back on the, the back side, uh, but up here at a former, we want to make sure that we do not make our round uh, a rounded corner in front of that former. In other words, we want the size to pass the former and then make the turn right at the former. So when we're sanding this, and we're gonna make the cut on the bandsaw, and after we sand that, we don't want it to sand around and, and come in front of that 18 and 3 eighths, because obviously you don't want your bend to be in front of the former, you want it to be right at the former, if that makes sense. So let's cut it off with the bandsaw. Okay, so I have cut pretty darn close to this line and what we're going to do now is take a sanding block 
uh, and come right down to the line where we see the exact same thickness of line all the way across. And again, we do not want to come past this uh, former right here. We want to come right up to it so that the side bends around it, but it has to get past it before it starts to bend, if that makes any sense. take long on this MDF to get it down to exactly where we want it. see just a trace of that line all the way across not even not even half of the line is remaining uh, and that's a, a, a pin line not a sharpie line just a little bit more up here and that got us just to well, the object is at least to get us just to that former and that looks pretty good I don't know if you can see that online or not but on the camera or not but that's going to be just right it's going to bend just after that former so we'll do the same thing for the uh, uh, bottom piece uh, of course it'll taper on both sides and uh, then we'll start lining out or, or laying out where we want our lightning holes Okay, let's make some decisions about where we're going to put these lightning holes uh, in the side of our template here. Uh, let's start at the rear, and I have found through trial and error that I like to give myself about 11 inches from the back of the uh, fuselage to uh, where I start doing the lightning holes. And that just gives me a little more room to get this servo in. So I did this one about 10, maybe nine and a half inches. And I squeezed that servo in there, but it was tight, and I would have liked to have given myself just a little bit more room. So, uh, 11 inches works out great to give me uh, plenty of room for that servo set back there, both the elevator and the rudder. So, let's get us a mark right there at 11 inches. Um, that is at 11 there. Uh, and the next hurdle that we have to come to is going to be where to put the wing. So, if we just hang a DLE 35 right there, and we know that our fuselage, the, the template that we cut is 47 and a half inches, and we know that the motor and standoffs are six and a half inches to the back of the prop, uh, that gives us 54 inches total from the back of the prop to the, wing, to the uh, rudder hinge line. So if you'll remember, we want the maximum thickness of our wing to be about 31, 32%. Uh, and if we uh, go with 17 inches off the back of the prop to the thickest part of our wing, that puts us right here. Uh, so all I did was uh, set uh, the wing up there and lined up the thickest part of the wing right there with that 17 inches and then I traced it uh, and I came up with uh, just a little rough template of where our wing is going to sit or a rough idea of where our wing is going to sit uh, and I decided to move this wing up in the fuselage at about 36 percent that's kind of an arbitrary number it's just it's just where I thought that it looked good to be honest with you um, if you get a little higher, uh, it's going to be more of a high wing characteristic. Some people say that it's the pendulum effect. That's not actually true. It helps keep it stable. It, it's more of a, a very complicated um, uh, phenomenon that has to do with lift. But uh, anyway, not, this is not the form to get into that. If you go low, uh, there's some stability issues that you could go there. 
or, or run into there as far as flying inverted or, or upright. I like to get the wing as close to center of the plane as I can. And of course, we're going to have the canopy up here. So uh, about 36% down from the top is, uh, I think, where that's going to put that. Remember, the canopy is going to sit up here. So probably around in there, it may end up being just a tad high. Uh, but still it's going to fly fine and, and if we don't like it we'll move it down. So uh, another benefit of uh, making this fuselage just a little bit taller and getting the wing just a little bit higher uh, is because I like to run the motor right in line with the that that goes right through the center of the wing and out the back of the plane. Uh, that just keeps everything neutral and in line there. Uh, and that will allow this motor to hang the way that we traditionally like to hang motors upside down, if you want to call it that. Uh, this motor here, uh, because this firewall is a little bit shorter, uh, is standing upright only because I didn't want it hanging down and getting in trouble if I did something silly and, and um, tore it up on the asphalt uh, runway or something like that. So the motor could care less which way it's facing. Uh, this way does give me a little more weight on top as opposed to hanging down in the bottom. But um, I think this plane's gonna fly even better because it already flies good with the motor sitting like that. And that'll even allow me to uh, build some sort of cowl later on. That motor there would be very difficult to get a cowl to work, but uh, I think we could do it here. So back to the uh, lightning holes. We know that we want to uh, leave area for these important parts there. So I have marked where the anti-rotation pin is on this template. I marked where the bolt hole is and of course where the wing tube socket is. So uh, if you look here, my anti-rotation pin is a little bit crowded. So I want to leave myself uh, a little more meat there. And if you notice on a later version, this, this plane here is about two and a half years old. I've been flying it for a good while. Uh, I even, I've already left that out. So we will make sure that we do not crowd that area right there. We give us plenty of room. And if we come up about an inch and a quarter, get a good distance from that, we can move that anti-rotation pin wherever we want. So, uh, had a pencil sitting right here somewhere. Anyway, we can just rough draw where we want to avoid uh, putting lightning holes there and here. So anywhere in this area right here is fair game. And underneath the wing tube, uh, we have a taller area here underneath the wing tube. So we can even take some weight out right there. Remember, this is a game of grams. Every gram counts. So uh, we can even put an area right there underneath the wing tube and not cause any problems, get some of that weight out. And remember, all the weight you take off of this doubler and uh, fuselage side is doubled, so uh, you get double the effect of the weight coming off. And this area, and we want to come forward of the wing tube here, so this area up front is fair game to take some weight out of. So we'll just rough mark an area that we can take some weight there. And let's see, there's an area right here, if you notice in front of that wing tube, that I wish that I had left that uh, triangle in because this is the hole that the servo wire goes through to get into the fuselage, this hole here. So somehow we have to get that wire in there. And if you just have open hole, uh, it goes through the covering and, and it's kind of sloppy. So you would like to have some plywood there that you can cut a hole in the covering, not, not slop around. So let's leave this triangle right here or this area in front of that hole open. And you can see in a later version, that's what I did here. This is all gonna make a lot more sense in just a minute when we start laying out uh, where we want these triangle holes. So this is the, uh, this former here, back where the, the plane starts to taper down and where the sides start to taper in. Obviously we have a former here and we want to come off of that former at least a half an inch, I would say, so that you have room to glue that former on the, each side and the top and the bottom. So 
just come in roughly a half inch there and on either side of these formers. So that gives us between the 11 mark and that former there, that turned out to be 18 inches. And if you divide that by an equal set of numbers there, that looks right. Uh, we can put three sets of lightning holes there. Um, so we'll have one, two, three, rather than, rather than the four, and they're gonna be a little bit longer, which I think should work out uh, nicely. So uh, three six inch sections of lightning holes here, and then that'll be left solid. And I think we'll even put a lightning hole up under the horizontal stab here because this area right here is so beefy and so strong because of this horizontal stab in there. You're, you're never gonna break the fuselage back there. It's never gonna break in here. So we can take as much of that meat out as we want and still be incredibly strong there. And we'll look at that in just a little bit, how much room we actually have. And then of course on the front up here, we wanna make sure that we leave enough room, enough meat there for this uh, aluminum bracket to epoxy to, to bond to. So you can tell here that I left about four inches uh, and that comes out to right at uh, three and three quarters or so. So we'll just start our lightning holes back about three quarters, uh, three and three quarters behind there. Again, that is a, an arbitrary number that just looks about right to me uh, to get enough bond for that epoxy. Uh, and the lightning holes on the inside double will be just a little bit different because we don't, they don't have to come all the way to the top there. Again, that'll make sense when we get to that part. So what we do uh, to cut these, these lightning holes out is uh, we need to border them with a uh, strip of hardwood. And this strip of hardwood uh, just happens to be uh, 3 eighths of an inch square. And I just cut it on the, the table saw. You could use MDF, oak, or, or whatever you wanted to use. Just make sure that it's, it's pretty straight, which these are not bad at all. Uh, I like using MDF because it stays straight. Uh, it's just a, a little more dusty when you're cutting it on the table saw. And I have a lot of, uh, a lot of scrap oak laying around. So what we'll do is uh, CA this piece along the bottom and essentially that leaves us this strip all the way across the bottom and we'll do the same thing for the top and then we'll start filling in uh, in the centers so let's put some uh, kicker across the bottom of that This happens to be flexing and put the flex down just to make it easier to go on. And we don't need a lot of CA at all, uh, just enough to hold it down. We're going to take this piece back off eventually, or you could leave it on, but I like to take them off just to make my template a little bit lighter and cleaner looking. So it doesn't take much CA at all, just enough to, to tack it down good and line it up with the bottom and work your way to the other end. And again, it doesn't have to be precise. You obviously want it to look good, uh, not be wavy, but if you're off by a couple hundred thousand, it's not gonna make any difference. You won't see it in that cut right there. It's gonna look good no matter what, if you get it, get it pretty straight. All right, so that's that piece. Let's get this plane out of the way. And cut us a strip to the top. Okay. 
You don't have to worry about cutting these at, at miter joints and all of that business. It doesn't make any difference because the bearing is not going to go to the corner. We're going to run a 3 8 flush fit bearing and you can leave that corner open by up to 3 8 and the bearing will not know. It'll make that corner, it'll round that corner and, and you never know. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that here in just a little bit. Let me cut that off. about three eighths so let's run the same thickness here and all we're going to do is just cut these roughly to the size they don't have to be exact <laughs> Sometimes I'll take a marker and mark that so that I can line it up center. All right, and remember this is where that last former is here, and we want to come past that former so that we can make the bend, right? So we want to give ourselves enough room to, to make that bend. And let's come off of it probably an inch or so. Uh, so let's measure that. So let's give ourselves an inch off of that former to make the bend. should give us plenty of room to get past that last former uh, and now we'll we'll divide these up into whatever shapes we decide that we want you can do an X right there uh, like that or you can just do the the single truss I happen to like the single truss I don't, I don't know that I get it any more strength out of doing the the x than i do the truss the the truss is easier it's quicker um i i haven't seen any issues at all with uh with going with the truss the the one brace rather than the x design so let's uh let's just do the, the single truss look there so putting these hardwood strips down is is pretty straightforward uh, a couple of tips that uh, I have learned along the way is don't worry about uh, getting your your corners or your miter joints and all that business uh, exactly right on these strips. That uh, bearing on the end of the uh, router bit is very forgiving. It's going to make a very nice rounded radius uh, despite the fact that uh, you haven't taken the time to to do a good miter joint or something like that. Just uh, get the pieces cut to where they'll go in there. Don't Again, don't worry about 45 degrees or anything like that. Just cut them all off 90 degrees and uh, use some medium CA to glue them down. As far as the CA goes, you don't want to use too much to where uh, it's a pain in the neck to get them all off later because we will chisel them off. Uh, but you want to use enough that the, uh, the router bit's not going to knock them off, or at least the bearing is not going to knock them off. Now we want to do in front of this former up here and remember we want to leave that piece in so essentially we're going to do the same thing here as we did there and mark that area real good so that we don't accidentally
take it out. check we've got our front area here that uh, we don't want anything in we want to leave this area solid so don't cut that out we want to cut that out we want to leave that of course uh, all of these areas we've got our rotation pin we've got our bolt hole we're cutting it close on the bolt hole right there so let's do ourselves a favor and just make a little uh, a little more room right there for that bolt. Alright, and all we're going to do is just put a little block of wood right there. Give us a little more meat where that that bolt head that wing bolt goes I don't know if you can see that um, it'll look good when we cut it out so this area here we're good we've got plenty of meat on either side of that former right there and plenty of room for the um, rotation pin anti-rotation pin let's glue these in So what we're going to do now is uh, take a drill and just drill holes that will allow the uh, flush bit router to go through. So this is the router bit that we're going to use. It's a flush trim bit. Uh, it's a 3 8 uh, diameter bit. So this bearing is 3 8 of an inch. And it's a half inch uh, shank. Now, for cutting these large cuts in this MDF, I would recommend using a half inch shank rather than a three, rather than a one quarter inch shank. It's just a lot stronger, a lot beefier. Now, the three eighths um, bearing at the top is not going to give us quite as sharp uh, as a radius as we're going to want. So, uh, once we cut all of the meat out of it, essentially, with a big heavy duty bit, we'll come back with a quarter inch shank bit. Uh, and cut these radius just a little bit sharper. It only takes a few seconds to do that after you cut the meat out. Essentially, um, you can see the pieces that we've just put in on this, this template. Um, that should look familiar, very, very familiar to what we just did. And our bit is going to ride against the pieces that we just glued in while the uh, cutters cut the other out. So we need uh, a way to get this bit through the MDF. You could use any drill that's bigger than a 3 8 obviously. Uh, I just like using a Forstner bit because it cuts through the MDF nicely. So while we're here, let's take some weight out of this tail. Uh, our horizontal stab is about that long, so we don't want to go out past the horizontal stab. We want to stay under it. 
because it's getting uh, uh, the horizontal stab is providing a whole lot of rigidity for us. So uh, the horizontal stab goes up in about that far, however far that happens to be, doesn't make any difference. As long as we don't go past it, let's double check that. back of the fuselage to the front of the horizontal stab uh, is about there and let's give ourselves at, at least a half inch uh, of extra there so that should do it and we're going to come down about a uh, half inch under the horizontal All right, so we've got holes in each of our areas. Make sure we've got them all. We're gonna leave that one. We're gonna leave this one. Uh, we should be good. We'll take it over to the router table and uh, I'll show you how we're set that up. Okay, let's take just a minute to talk about a router table. You do not have to have an elaborate uh, router system set up. Just a basic table uh, will work. One of the store-bought tables uh, or you can build your own. Uh, I've built four or five. They're, they're scattered throughout the shop because I do a lot of furniture work uh, and work with a lot of routers. So uh, most of my tables are just a couple of pieces of MDF laminated together. Um, you can use a piece of plywood. It, it doesn't make any difference. Um, and uh, just mount those on top of a, uh, a cabinet or a box or, or however you want to do it. This one happens to roll around because it's a small shop and, and I happen to move it around in here. But uh, my point is you can have something as simple as a piece of MDF with a hole cut in it that your router will sit down in with a uh, router uh, plate. Uh, and then just, uh, I have even sat it on top of a uh, garbage can uh, or a plastic drum and drilled a hole in that so that I can run a shop back in. I do that a lot when I'm traveling up to uh, uh, family who live out of town. I'm going to be there several days and I want to do some work while I'm there. Uh, so even a basic uh, router table of some sort will be fine. Uh, this happens to be a three quarter, uh, three and uh, uh, a quarter horse router. Uh, the biggest router that you can get I, I would recommend. Uh, certainly don't have to buy anything new. Uh, you can buy these things um, dirt cheap used. Uh, this happens to be an old one, uh, an old Makita uh, that is still running very, very well. It's probably 20 years old. Uh, so uh, my point is you don't have to spend a lot of money on the tools that we're going to be doing, we're going to be using to, to build these parts. So I have chucked our uh, flush bit router trim or flush trim router bit in there. Um, and I have run it up to, this is very important, and, and I have, and I'm sure you will too, forget to double check that your bearing height is where you want it. Remember we want it to ride against the pieces, the guides that we just put on here. So you want to come above the MDF, probably uh, a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch, and let our bearing ride against the hardwood real good. Uh, so we've got that in, we've got a cinch down and in place. Okay, let's double check our bearing height to make sure we're up on the hardwood where we want to be and it looks good. Uh, everything's locked down, we've got dust collection on. So, let's see what we get. I have no idea why the video stopped recording. I'm, I may have leaned against the, the little uh, remote there. Uh, but anyway, I finished cutting it. Uh, once you've seen a couple of holes cut, it's, it's kind of like watching grass grow. 
So the next thing I'll do is uh, pull the hardwood strips off. I'll use a little chisel to do that, but I think it turned out looking real good. So that's what our piece is going to uh, look like, or our template's going to look like. Uh, if you remember, that's where we put the little block. Uh, the wing bolt actually goes about right here. So uh, we gave ourselves another 3 eighths, almost a half of an inch of meat right there just to, to give that some room. And uh, a new addition, we added the lightning hole underneath the uh, horizontal staff. Uh, so it, it looks real good. So let's pull the uh, hardwood off of it and I will go ahead and transfer the former lines to uh, the bottom template and uh, of course put a landing gear pad in there. No need to uh, drag you guys through that. It's straightforward. You know how to do it now. Uh, and I'll show you how that piece looks once I get it uh, formed up with the hardwood. Okay, so I've cut the MDF template for the bottom or at least the blank for the template and I've lined it up uh, exactly with the, uh, the side template here. So remember the most important former here is this one here, and that's where the taper begins. So we wanna make darn sure that we get those two lined up, uh, and these need to line up, because we want that former to sit right in the center of each of these, in the center of the sides and the center of the bottom. So it's very important that these line up because remember they're only three eighths of an inch thick. It's not a lot of room for a, a error there, an eighth inch either way since the uh, light fly is uh, one eighth thick. So uh, what I like to do is uh, go ahead and mark that former and then uh, set the top up on top of the bottom like this and get it lined up nice and straight so that it's square line it up at the front and line it up along the bottom here before that taper starts. And then you can just take your pen and mark where these formers are. And that way you know you're going to put the hardwood pieces in exactly the right spot. So there we are. As long as we put those hardwood pieces there, our uh, um, formers are gonna line up exactly where they need to be. So little tip there, uh, learn by trial and error. The uh, landing gear pad needs to go right here. And I found through trial and error, you can see where I have changed this template, the former template. Uh, basically, I, I didn't cut that part out. Uh, just to give myself a little more meat right there where the landing gear is. Uh, not because it needs to be strong, because we're gonna use aluminum uh, uh, trusses down there in the bottom or aluminum supports down there in the bottom. Uh, but just so that the, the when you bolt the landing gear on, uh, it bolts nice and flat. In, in other words, you've got a flat surface for it to fit on. You don't have these lightning holes uh, with, with cover on top of them. So we will avoid that section there. So put up a couple of marks in that area and we will just stay away from that. And we want to come off the front probably, I don't know, maybe the thickness of this this thing here, it's, it doesn't really matter. So we can cut lightning holes out of here. Uh, we want to leave this intact and we want to leave this area intact because that is underneath the wing too. Don't know for sure that we need to leave it. Uh, I just always have. Uh, and it's a good platform for the fuel tank to sit on. So we've got meat here and meat here so the, the fuel tank can sit on top of it and we'll put a lightning hole right here and a lightning hole right there. Probably rectangular ones. Uh, I don't think it needs triangles down there. A, a good rectangle will be fine in both of these areas here. And then this area will put us a, uh, we're moving this former to here. So we'll come in front of that former again about, about an inch. And there's nothing here that we need to worry about. Nope, not on the bottom. Uh, so we'll come forward of that former right there, probably about an inch. Now let's make sure we do have room, now that I think about it, uh, for this former. This is a uh, very important former here. And yes, we are. We can put it right there. So that that former that heart, that um, plywood birch plywood former, the only birch plywood former in the plane, 
which is right in front of the wing tube, will go there, and we've got plenty of room for it to sit right there. So that should work. Let's, uh, so we're an inch forward of this former. So that's former uh, number one. That's former number two right there. And then three, four, and then five sits right there. So that's all five of them. And this area we will not cut out. So don't cut that, don't cut that, and don't cut in here. Now we can probably afford to lose some of this. Uh, but let's just leave it there for now. Uh, find a fuselage and I'll show you what I mean. So the bottom will fit in here and we want to make sure that we don't get too far back with a light in the hole that we start causing problems for our vertical stab stabilizer. So that vertical stab needs to sit right there. Uh, so pull that out and put it there. So we should probably put us a light in hole, a small light in hole right here and uh, not have any problems at all. So let's do that. And if it does look like it causes a problem, all we have to do on the next one is just on the, uh, the parts we cut out, it's just not cut it out, just leave it solid. So while we're building this, uh, build that out and we'll, looks like we can get away with coming to about right in there. Plenty of uh, plenty of extra room. This uh, this whole area back here is incredibly strong structurally, so uh, we could take a good bit of, of this out and not have any problem. The turtle deck adds a lot of structural integrity. I don't know if you can see it through there, but um, even that foam turtle deck stiffens things up a lot. So uh, I think we'll be good to put a little light in hole right there. So let me get this framed up with hardware and I'll, uh, excuse me, hardwood and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, so I've framed uh, our bottom piece up and uh, drilled our holes. Took me uh, 18 and a half minutes to, to do that, so that's not bad. Um, I know it took a long time to do this one, but uh, while I'm filming and explaining, it takes a little longer. Once you get a, a, a little bit of practice under your belt, you can move pretty quickly. So, you know, under 20 minutes to make that's not bad at all. So, um, let's double check it to make sure that uh, we've got the holes drilled where we want, or at least we're going to uh, route them out where we want. So here's the landing gear pad, that's not going to interfere with the side. There is the um, wing saddle area, and most importantly, here is former number two, former number three, four, and five line up, and then our little lightning hole back here. So I think we're good to go. Let's take it over the router table and uh, route it out. All right, dust collection zone, our bearing height, we'll double check that. take just a minute and talk about uh, router form uh, or proper router form. If, um, if you haven't run a router before, particularly on a, a flush bit, what you want to make sure you do is go in the right direction. So you want to go in the direction that the router is spinning or the bit is spinning. Uh, in this case, it happens to be a counterclockwise move. So I am going counterclockwise around that way. That way the bit is always biting uh, into the piece as I'm moving against it. If you go the other way, the bit will grab and, and try to pull the piece. It's not gonna pull it out of your hand or anything like that, but um, it, it could mess your your uh, nice clean cut up a little bit. So, uh, just a little router tip for those who may be, may be new to it. <laughs>
we notice these sections here, because our bit radius was so wide, we didn't get far into that cut. So I installed a, uh, a, smaller, a smaller flush trim bit and uh, it will reach further up into that cut. So uh, let's see how much further it goes. And we'll mark what is the current end of that cut right there. And this one right here. And it's not going to really make a big difference on those others, but these long, narrow ones, it will. Like that one and that one. So just for the heck of it, let's see how much further it goes. All right, so you can see that uh, it went a good bit deeper, probably a good uh, five eighths of an inch deeper into that cut. And it, it sharpened our uh, radius on each one of those up. So uh, we probably took, I don't know, four or five grams off the, uh, uh, the part just by going that extra, those extra lengths there. And if you don't want the, uh, the sharp corners, uh, all it does is increase the size of this web right here. Uh, so if you want that web to be bigger, just run a bigger bit when you're making your part and it won't go all the way into that corner. So cutting them uh, as far as you can go on the initial template uh, is nice because it gives you the option to, to make your part go all the way that far uh, or use a bigger bit and not go quite that far. So uh, it just gives us more options later on. But uh, that's a good looking part. I like that. Now that we've got our side and our bottom template cut out of the MDF, uh, we need to go ahead and, and finish up our top template. If you remember, we cut it large, probably in a sixteenth or an eighth inch larger than the bottom because we're going to use the bottom to make the top. There's no need to put our, our pieces of wood strips in here since we already have a template made. And if we want to, we can just turn it over and it'll be a mirror image uh, just like this. You can see how those uh, little trusses go that way on the top and that way on the bottom. So uh, you can run them some way, the same way or, or mirror them. I don't think it'll make any difference. Uh, it just seems to be that we would give a little bit more rigidity um, mirroring those. So what we need to do so that we can use this top template and use it to make our parts is to drill some holes for alignment pins uh, to hold everything nice and still. So what we need to do is set our part uh, up underneath, our top up underneath, and get it lined up. Put some glasses on here. Uh, I've got a center line that goes down the center and we're gonna line it up perfectly on that side, line it up up here. And what I have already done is, uh, and we've got about a 16th or an H hanging out on all sides so that we know that that router, that flush pit router is gonna make our bottom piece exactly the same as the top. So make sure the bottom one is hanging out. You could probably go as much as a quarter of an inch. It's just gonna make your router work that much harder. So. Um, I'm pretty good at staying right next to that line, and as long as you stay outside that line, you're okay. And in, in some spots, I'm down as much as a sixteenth, in some spots, I'm I'm up as much as a uh, an eighth there. But anyway, uh, and once I get it in in place and everything's lined up, then I just traced out these holes roughly. You don't have to be exact at all, uh, just to give us an idea of where to drill our holes. Uh, and then go back with your big drill bit. Uh, in this case, I used a, I don't know, I think a five eighths drill bit and just drill those, those holes for your router bit to access through. And then uh, set it back up on top of here, get it lined up nicely. And we'll take a three sixteenths drill bit and drill some holes 
strategically, uh, and it, it doesn't really make any difference uh, where we put them, but uh, strategically scatter them out so that it will hold uh, your bottom piece, which is going to be one eighth light ply, remember, in place. Uh, for right now, it's going to be holding our, our top part. And I like to put the holes uh, in these beefy areas here, the way where the webbing has come together, and I don't run them where the um, former is going to be. Uh, I've done that a couple of times. I messed up and I ended up that my alignment pin was right there and glue loses out of it later on. So just get off of that alignment pin a little, where, a little ways. doesn't really matter where you put it there. And, and this will make a little more sense in just a little while. And then put your nice alignment pin back here somewhere. And... I will drill that out on the drill press with 3 16 uh, drill bit, and then we'll just use alignment pins, a 3 16 dowel rod, to shove down through both of them, and the, the pins in, in these places will hold everything together while we put it on the router table and route that out. So, like I said, it'll make a little more sense in just a minute when you see it done, but uh, let me go drill these holes out, and I'll be right back. All right, so I ran our top piece over to the drill press right quick and, and drilled our 3 16 holes in the locations that we marked. Again, it doesn't matter exactly where we put those, just, just get them where you think that they're going to work. Now, I've chucked the 3 16 bit in a drill, uh, just a hand drill here. The key to this is to make sure that you drill straight down. You don't want to wallow out the holes that we have in the template here. If uh, you're a little bit nervous about that, take it back over to the drill press and drill it straight. And you know where you know that it, you won't be uh, wallowing that hole out. Uh, but it's not that hard. Just uh, drill the holes out. And you can feel the bit to guide you down as you're turning slowly. It's a lot easier than you think it's going to be to stay straight. And it is key to go straight. We want the holes to run straight through both parts. Uh, and we'll put our little alignment pins in. Make sure everything's lined up. Now I have used uh, this little stud, which is good. Um, I have used blue tape just to hold it in place, to clamp it in place for me. And now's a good time to talk about blue tape. I have um, painter's tape. It's what we will use uh, a lot throughout this process. You'll see that we go through an awful lot of blue tape to uh, clamp things together, hold things together, and uh, to keep epoxy from getting out of control and that sort of thing. I have found uh, through using an awful lot of tape that the Scotch Blue uh, 2090, number 2090, of course, these people aren't giving me any money or anything like that. I wish they did. Uh, but I have found that that works the best for me. Uh, use whatever you want, but uh, that works great for me. This is the one inch, and of course, I have the two inch version as well. I think that's two inch. It might be a little wider. No, it's two inch. Uh, and it is also the number 2090. I have found that it has the the right combination of stickiness to it, uh, but it pulls off without pulling balsa apart and, and those sort of things because we want this tape to come right back off and then um, we wad it up, throw it in the trash. And, and we will just about fill up a trash can full of watered up blue tape by the time we're done. The other tape that I use is, uh, I guess this is masking tape. Uh, I don't know if it's actually called painter's tape or, or masking tape, but again, it's scotch and it's the number 2020. So for the really, really tough stuff that we need to clamp together, uh, we'll use the yellow or, or tan or whatever it's called, but it's the scotch number 2020. Uh, pretty easy to come by. You can, you can get those in any of the box stores or, or Amazon or any of the others. So enough of tape. Um, I'm going to move this over to the router table. Okay, we've got one more template to make before we start cutting out the actual parts, and that is the doubler for the first part of the, or the first half of the fuselage here. Uh, to make that is very, very simple. All we need to do is duplicate this, uh, this template from here forward. So I have lined a piece of uh, MDF up with the face side, or the beginning of where this former is, former number two. And... I have cut it to the exact length where it goes all the way up to the front of the firewall and it matches the side or the top and the bottom there. So 
uh, at a later time, we will trim one eighth of an inch off the bottom. That will account for the bottom of the fuselage. And we'll trim a three sixteenths off of a three sixteenths length off the front. And that will help us register uh, and locate the firewall. Uh, that'll make a lot more sense later on when we get to that part. But uh, what we need to do now is uh, cut the lightning holes out. So I will line this piece up exactly along the top of the bottom and the front. Take my 3 16 drill and drill some alignment holes. Let's drill this one first. Ooh, nope, that one because it's on top of my What I realized there at the last second is that uh, I didn't have my backer board down there, uh, scrap board, and I'd rather drill a hole in this than in the table, so. Again, these alignment pin hole locations are not critical. Just put them uh, where they're not going to get in the way. Obviously, where there's going to be a former would be in the way. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, anywhere else is fair game to put these things. And they all came through. All right, now uh, what we will do is consider where we want these lightning holes to be. There's no reason that all of these back here can't match the, uh, the side perfectly. So we'll go ahead and cut all those out. Just, just put a little mark on those that those are the ones we are gonna cut out. Uh, we, let's see, this is the bottom and this is where the landing gear is. We do not want to cut that one out. So let's leave it blanked out. Remember our landing gear uh, need some extra support there. So on the inside uh, of the firewall, we're gonna leave that intact. And this leave this one intact as well, not take that light and hole out. And the reason is this aluminum piece right here, this aluminum bracket will ride across there. And that'll just give us some more epoxy room. So if we leave that out, um, if we leave that intact, we'll have more epoxy space going across there. So that should work for us. We could also put some extra, we could take some meat out of here on the doubler. Uh, there's no need in, in not taking some of that weight out. Remember again, it's a, it's a game of grams here. So if we wanna take some of that out, we can. And this is an area that we could do it Uh, right in here, so pull our doubler out and see where we can do that. So mark the lightning hole that we are taking out. This one here. We do intend to take that one. So our lightning hole could come right in here somewhere. We want to leave enough room for the aluminum there. So we could come right in here and give ourselves a lightning hole and essentially do the same thing down here on the bottom side. So I'll rough that out um, with some, some stick pieces as you're used to seeing and take it over the router table and route it out and I'll show you what it looks like uh, when it get done. You, you've seen plenty of this done by now. You don't need to, to go through that again. All right. Okay, so I cut out the uh, doubler template. Uh, after you get several of these under your belt, it gets pretty quick. I think that took me about 11 minutes. So that, that's not bad. They go pretty quick after you, after you get used to doing it. So the next thing we need to do is trim one eighth inch off the bottom and that will account for the bottom of the, the uh, fuselage that sits in there. Remember the, the doubler comes down and sits on top of the bottom, which is of course is a uh, eighth inch uh, light ply and the doubler goes up to meet the firewall. Uh, it doesn't, the firewall doesn't uh, butt glue to the both of those. Uh, it comes up, it sits on, sits in between the two sides and the doubler comes up to meet it. 
So I use a uh, 3 16 firewall. There's no need in using uh, the traditional quarter inch or 5 16 on a plane this size uh, because we're using these aluminum brackets, right? And that helps distribute all of that load back to a much larger area and, and take everything away from that one corner right there. So we need to take off 1 16 up here on the front and we need to take off 1 8 down here on the bottom and I like to mark that before I go over to the table saw because uh, as soon as I don't uh, we'll verify that I am on the bottom and that this is the front uh, as soon as I don't mark it right here uh, I'll cut it off the wrong end and off the top so let me cut those on the table saw right quick and um, we'll get to making parts all right a quick double check uh, I've got the doubler cut out and I've got uh, several of the alignment pins in. You want to, whenever you're double checking something, you want to make sure that you're, uh, a good many of your alignment pins are in. If you just put two in, it can move just a little bit, I found. So put a bunch of them in and you're locked in place exactly where you're going to be making your template. One little tip that I, I failed to mention earlier was um, when I'm cutting this 3 16 back, let's go. Um, probably a, a 30 seconds further. In other words, let the side stick out about a 30 seconds past the, uh, the firewall when it's assembled. And that will allow us to uh, sand that perfectly smooth when, it, when we're done. That'll make a lot of sense when we get to that point. But uh, uh, the tip there is don't, don't cut off exactly 3 16ths, cut off just a little bit more. Maybe give yourself a 64th or 30 seconds more. Uh, just so you can just barely feel that uh, other template on the bottom there. So we want to now double check to make sure that our this piece of scrap eighth black ply is good and straight and it fits perfectly down here on this step. So remember that's the bottom and that doubler will sit on top of that bottom piece right there. So that gives us enough room for the side to go all the way down and the doubler sits on top of the bottom with the firewall going here, actually like this, more like that. So I think we're ready to start cutting parts out. Okay, so I've cut all of the light fly blanks out uh, over at the table saw and it took just about a half a sheet, a little less than a half a sheet of plywood or light fly to uh, cut out enough parts for two planes. I would recommend, uh, at least on this first build, the first, the first time using these templates, is to uh, just make enough parts for two planes. You're tempted to cut out a whole bunch of them. Uh, I would limit it to like two in case there's some modification that's, that you notice that you want to make like leaving some of these spots uh, filled in or, or, or changing something, uh, some minor changes or something like that. So I would just uh, build two to start with. And if you like those, then, then go full bore, make as many as you want. Uh, so of course we have the sides, uh, the bottom, the top, and the doublers. Let's go ahead and attach uh, these parts and we'll cut them out two at a time uh, to their respective templates and uh, get making some parts. That's what we've been waiting to do. And one thing we want to make sure is that we maximize our, um, our light fly the way we want to, want to uh, use it. I say this piece out because it's got a, uh, uh, basically a knot. Of course, it's, it's three layers, so it only goes through one of the, the outer skins, but still, it doesn't look very nice. Uh, structurally, it's not gonna make any difference at all for us, but sometimes that's the nature of uh, any plywood and, and sometimes light ply. Most of the time, light ply is very clear. It just has these uh, tiny little knots if you have any at all. Uh, but for some reason, this one had a, a couple of big knots. So. We want to uh, maximize that, or at least minimize any impact that it could have. So I take the piece and lay it up on uh, 
the blank that we have. And of course, here's a knot here, but we're gonna cut that out. So I just put me a, a, a little mark with a pencil right there so I know how to lay this piece out to get uh, the best, the most best wood out of it. And this one here doesn't really matter how it goes. It's, it's a really nice piece. And all of the other ones I cut were very, very clear. And light ply usually is, but for some reason, this one had a couple of blemishes on it. And also you wanna make sure that, uh, you know, in, in shipment or something like that, uh, if you're hauling around, sometimes you'll ding a corner. Just pay attention to make sure you don't put the ding up on this end where it can mess you up. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, just take a piece of tape and tape these two pieces together so they uh, sit perfectly together, perfect alignment. And it's just easier to, to maintain them that way. All right, that'll hold it together good. And then we want to set our template up. template up here and remember we want our light ply blanks to hang over the template all the way around so I'm situating this where I have about a sixteenth all the way around and if you, you you're welcome to cut your blank just a little bit bigger to give yourself a little more leeway um, I cut mine pretty close just because I've gotten um, pretty good at cutting them out but e even then I'm a little more uh, I have a little less meat there than I, I feel comfortable with really so I'll put a piece of tape here to hold that in place while we drill the, the holes Check it, and yep, we're sticking out all the way around. And grab a 3 16 drill bit. And remember, we're using the MDF as a drill guide here, so make sure that we're not wallowing out the holes in the MDF as we're drilling through the, uh, the light ply. I think I'll tell you what we'll take it to the uh, bandsaw and cut this off. You could do it at the router table. It's just easier to nib it off at the bandsaw. So I'll do that and uh, meet you at the router table here in just a minute. Okay, so we've got our light ply blanks uh, attached and pinned in to the uh, the template itself. I've got the uh, three eighths bit installed, dust collector zone. Let's cut our piece of that. All right, so there are both the fuselage sides for one fuselage. They look pretty darn good. I like that. Time to put our doublers or attach our doublers to our sides. Uh, obviously, we have two sides, and those sides are going to come up and, and face each other on the inside. 
This will be the right side, obviously, because this is down and, and up here. So I have found to keep these things straight, uh, the best thing for me to do is to mark them. So I'm gonna put an R right there, and this is the corresponding doubler for that side. Uh, and remember, it steps on the bottom here, so it will get glued on exactly like that. So I like to put an R right there. So when I glue these two together, I know that those R's have to match up. And of course, we're gonna put an L here and make sure that that matches up exactly right. That's what we want. And I can get my pen to work. Uh, let's right pencil. And we'll put an L there and an L there. Triple check it. And that's going to be just right. Remember we have our step along the bottom there, our step along the bottom here, and then these two pieces will fit like that. So it's always a good idea to triple check to make sure that you're putting it in the right position. And we'll get these two out of the way and start with this one. Now, I don't use uh, accelerator or kicker when I'm, when I'm doing this because uh, I need just a little bit, a few more seconds of shifting around time. And I will use the dust collector to pull these fumes out of the way. Every little bit helps. It doesn't take a lot of glue, just enough to um, keep it from delaminating. You'd be surprised how strong this glue is on this light fly. I just put a uh, small bead scattered about. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. I try to get close to the outside. Uh, make sure I get every one of those uh, stringer areas there. doesn't take a lot. You don't want it squeezing out on you. It's also a big mess that you just have to clean up later. That looks, that looks pretty good. So we've got our two L's. We're going to fold this over. And no need to panic. We've got plenty of time without an accelerator to be shifting this around. And if you line these little ribs here up and the top, You'll find that it's a lot easier than it looks. It feels pretty good. Put it straight all the way around. And if you want to, you can take a pin and just double check that that's, these two are lining up exactly right. And they are. It's, it's pretty darn good. And just put a little bit of weight on it. to start the kick. That should be fine. And we're perfectly flat along the top. We've got our three sixteenths there and our one eighth down here just check that one eighth make sure it's done and it is it feels perfect so that's a uh, that's a good side part with a doubler now we do have a little bit of uh, glue that has not dried yet in this area so we can just take a paper towel and wipe that just to keep it from looking sloppy and that looks good One more little spot. There we go. That's a good looking part. So I'll do the other one, uh, and then we'll go to uh, making our jig to glue these parts up. Okay, now it's time to make our fuselage build jig. Uh, it's nothing more than a piece of scrap MDF. I think mine happens to be eight inches wide here. Uh, it doesn't make any difference as long as it's wide enough to act as a base. 
and to hold a uh, couple of pieces of uh, scrap MDF uh, as, as guides. Now these guides will hold the sides as in place as we are uh, tacking them together with CA. So they'll act just like that. So we have the bottom in place and we set the sides on top of the bottom. And of course we'll have these pieces here to act as a guide or a wall to help hold those in place. Uh, again, it'll make more sense, uh, hopefully in a little bit when we get to that part. But what we need to do first is get our bottom piece perfectly centered. Uh, and of course I have a center line going down the, the bottom of this scrap MDF. So we will center our bottom piece perfectly over this piece of MDF. And we'll take a, a just a, another scrap piece that's the same width and set it up here on top. And then we can put a mark on either side of that, the, the base piece, the bottom template or the bottom piece there, the bottom part. And that's where we will cut our uh, 3 16 uh, slots. We'll have a slot here and a slot there that the sides will actually register into. And that'll keep the sides from tilting from side to side and just help us out a little bit. So uh, that needs to be one inch, one eighth of an inch thick. Uh, that slot there does. So let me go ahead and cut that groove. I'm running a fin kerf table saw blade, so it's not an eighth inch. I'm having to take a couple of passes at it to get it exactly an eighth. You don't want this, uh, these slots to be too thick or your, your sides will flop around in there. I'm gonna let this hang way off that table saw. Uh, I usually don't work on a table saw, but it's uh, handy to be in front of the camera right now. Second piece here. Oops, that's not good. where is it? Here it is. I have a second piece that's exactly three quarters of an inch taller, so it can sit down. Uh, all it can go all the way to the bottom. So I'm going to uh, CA these two pieces together, uh, as well as CA it to the bottom, and then ultimately I will run decking screws, probably two inch decking screws, uh, back that way and up through the bottom, just to help. Uh, attach all that together so I'll do that and get right back with you and we want to make sure that we're sitting on that shelf and we are so that looks really really nice we'll pull it up nice and square and then we're going to uh, you guessed it just CA in and down and I'm not going to put a lot of CA on there just enough to hold it in place and we will run decking screws to hold it down permanently or semi-permanently. That's just in case we need to move it for some reason. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I think you can see that on the camera, how that works. I hope so anyway. Uh, so we put, our, we put our bottom piece in place, make sure we get all the, the, the sawdust out of the way, and then take one, one half, and make sure that it slides all the way in, take the other half, make sure that it slides all the way in, make sure that it sits all the way down, and it is, and you can look back here to make sure that it's sitting on the, the uh, jig nice and flat. And what we'll, we'll do now, 
uh, when I glue these up. Uh, all I do now is just take some scrap pieces of uh, eighth inch light ply. Just some of these scraps that we cut off and kind of shim them up in there like wedges. And they will, they will help us make that bend right there. Grab another one. There we go. And that's it. So we'll take uh, CA and just put a dab, just a, a very small dab in five or six places in here just to tack it together. We don't want to glue it together yet because uh, we will actually glue it at another stage, but we do want to tack it together nice and tight. So we'll put some tacks in through here and then we'll come back and, and tack this area. Uh, I don't think that we actually need anything to hold these in. We can do that by hand while we put some tacks in there. So the jig holds it nice and nice and steady for us and we can do this part by hand. We don't have to worry about having a jig for that. All right, so let's start making the templates to uh, make our formers. Obviously former number one will be the first one that we need to make. It's up here on the, the square part of the fuselage and it is the only one that is the width of both the doublers um, width of the bottom counting the doublers in other words so that should be four inches we'll double check that and you want to check at the bottom right not at the top because anything could be happening around here at the top but our bottom is pressed firmly out against the sides uh and you may see that i put some blue tape on the inside of that that just helps if there's any uh ca gets um uh, dribbled out there accidentally. Uh, I found over the, the years that sometimes you'll get blue tape or, or get CA that wants to ooze out more than, uh, than you want it to and it'll stick uh, your part down there and you have to kind of pull it up. Not that big a deal, it, it will pull out, um, but it just it's just like putting a non-stick surface down there. So we're measuring at the bottom, should be four inches. I do see exactly four inches there. Uh, I've got a piece of um, 330 seconds uh, birch plywood here. And that's what I use for former number one. All of the other formers, of course, are light ply. I use the, uh, the plywood here. Of course, we're gonna cut, cut out and make that a regular looking former. Um, I use the birch plywood here because it's stronger right around that wing tube. It's probably overkill, truth be known, but uh, it's a lot more durable than light ply, so that's where I put it. So I've cut a piece to the right height. That's, uh, that's fairly straightforward. I'm going to cut this just a little bit wider than uh, four inches and you want to make this make sure it's perfectly square because uh, the former is what helps keep this these walls uh, or sides perfectly square to the bottom so uh, this piece is perfectly square I'm going to put a mark for exactly four inches and I'm going to cut just a little bit outside the mark and uh, probably a couple of trips back and forth to, to the table saw to get that exactly right. So I'm gonna cut outside of it and kind of work my way back. Sure there's no trash underneath the bottom here and you'll need to constantly be checking that every now and then a piece of sawdust to get under there and hold you up and you won't realize it until uh, after you've glued it together uh, but I'm fitting 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 very uh, very tight down there on the bottom and I have a good tight fit all the way around we're pushing that down and that helps hold everything nice and square so that piece is the size that we want uh, our next piece that we need to cut is here and that'll be light ply 
So I'll go ahead and uh, cut that piece out and then we'll just work our way back. And we wanna get all of these um, formers to their correct size before we make the templates or the jigs that we'll use to cut those out. So I'll get the, uh, the remaining four of these cut to size and then we'll start making the, the templates. Okay, so I've cut the blanks out uh, for each of the five formers. And be very careful that you, that you measure correctly and, and get them right because every one that we make off of the jigs that we're gonna be making or the templates is gonna be exact duplicate of this one that you make. So make sure that it fits very flush in the bottom corners down there. Don't worry about the top so much because uh, or don't make the mistake of measuring across the top because you know this top's gonna be sitting wherever it happens to be sitting. Uh, but the bottom is going to be exactly where it needs to be because it's sitting up against the bottom or the floor of our fuselage. So uh, again, I have very carefully made sure each one of these is the, uh, the exact width down at the bottom corners and make sure that they're square, of course. And then I leave one eighth of an inch at the top. Uh, just use a piece of scrap uh, light cloth to make sure you leave yourself enough room at the top so that we can lay the fuselage uh, top or ceiling in uh, when we're done. So I've got an eighth of an inch clearance there. All of my, uh, my both of my corners are nice and tight. And when I pull it in uh, and push down good, make sure it's against the floor, that makes a perfectly square fuselage. So uh, another tip that you wanna make sure that you double check is this first uh, former. Remember, fits between the doublers, right? So it's exactly um, one eighth and one eighth, uh, one quarter of an inch thinner than this one, right? Make sure that you have the same width all the way across this uh, fuselage front part here. Uh, because when we're putting our canopy on, we don't wanna make sure that this is not more narrow than that. We should be exactly right, but just double check that, that uh, down at the bottom, of course, it runs the, exactly the same width from one end to the other. And this first former will go right there in front of the wing tube. And of course, this is the one out of the 3 uh Birch plywood. We'll also make a uh, template to cut the lightning hole out of it. So let me round up some uh, scrap materials to uh, build the jigs for these, and we'll get started on that. All right, so it's time that we make our jigs uh, or templates for the formers themselves. And essentially all we have is a, a back plate, which uh, we'll start off with that being a solid black back plate. And then uh, just some spacers. See, there's a spacer sat in the center there. And then uh, our bearing guide that goes around the top. And you'll recognize the bearing guide on, on this sort of piece we made out of hardwood strips. And uh, essentially these are the same two types of parts, except this one has a spacer between so we could slide that uh, former blank in, uh, drill a hole in it, just like we're used to seeing, and then take it over to the router table, set it down on the router, and then cut those pieces out, pull our little uh, top keeper piece out, and then pull our finished uh, former out. So uh, let's get putting this thing together. I have got a piece of plywood here. It's just a scrap uh, quarter inch plywood. It doesn't matter how big it is. Just make it bigger, maybe an inch or, or an inch and a quarter all the way around than your part that you're gonna make. Uh, and we will square it up later. So you see how all this is nice and square looking. Don't worry about that until we get to the end. We'll run it through the table saw and make it look pretty. Uh, or as pretty as one of those things can look. So uh, don't worry about what your piece looks like. Most important is that it's flat. Uh, we need it to be flat because uh, we want our piece to fit in there nicely. And then I've got some spacers uh, that I cut. These are probably 3 16 thick, uh, probably a 16th thicker than the plywood that we're using, the 8th inch plywood. And that just gives us enough uh, clearance that we can slide that piece in and out. And we don't want more, I would say no more than a 16th, a 32nd or a 16th is, uh, is going to be enough because you don't want that piece to get chattering in there, bouncing up and down. You want it to hold it fairly snug, but not so tight that you can't pull it out. Uh, and again, uh, like you're used to hearing me say, it's gonna make a lot more sense uh, in just a few minutes when you see it happening. So our first step is uh, 
put our blank, blank piece of uh, plywood down, our backer plate, uh, take a piece of our spacer that is probably 3 16 and we're gonna glue it to, and I'm wearing a glove because I, uh, one, don't like gluing my hand with all the CA, and two, I don't want all that uh, kicker on me. As much as I can avoid. And again, it doesn't have to be perfectly straight. Don't worry about that. Just get semi-straight because we're gonna straighten it up later. You don't want the glue oozing out on the inside though that could hold your piece off. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of glue. Just make sure that it doesn't ooze to the inside. If it does, wipe it out of the way right quick. So that piece should go there. And then we need to cut a short piece for here and a longer piece for there. And it did, the short one doesn't have to come all the way to the end because all that is is a stopper. It could probably even be you know an inch and a half long. It doesn't make any difference. I cut them just about to the exact size. But. All right, that piece will go there. And then we need a longer piece for here. Let's go ahead and glue this piece on. Now we remember we want to make sure we give just enough clearance where that piece can slide in and out. And it's important that, it, that it's able to slide all the way out. So it doesn't want to be so snug that you can't get it in and out. But again, we want it to be snug enough that it doesn't chatter back and forth. zoom that camera in on the workpiece from here on in. All right, that should be better. We want this to be square down here. It's the most important. It doesn't have to come all the way to the end. We just want it to be nice and square to our part. So use the part to hold it very square. And that should do that. All right, so now we need our top guide pieces. And this is where we need to make a decision. So here is a uh, former, this happens to be F3 out of another plane. We need to decide how wide we want these, how wide we want the part to be or how thick we want the part to be ultimately because that determines how far in we bring our bearing guide, if that makes sense. So. Uh, this piece is, I don't know, that looks like about 7 16 um, But it, it doesn't really matter as long as we make it uniform all the way around. And I think for this large former, I'm going to pull it in probably about that far. So let me grab um, a piece of hardwood and we'll use that to make some lines around. So here's a piece of half inch balsa is going to work great for our purpose. I think half inch looks about right. So all I'm going to do is use this as a uh, as a marker and just mark all the way around. And I think that's going to be a thick enough. I think that'll make our part thick enough that we'll be okay. And obviously when we get to the smaller ones, we'll, uh, we'll come up on edge and that one's a little bit more than a quarter inch, but uh, we'll make that decision when we get to that one, how thick we want to be. So the next step is uh, putting our bearing guide on. Now I like using uh, hardboard, quarter inch hardboard for that purpose. Uh, 
one it's, it's super stable it always stays straight better than the quarter inch plywood i actually prefer to use hardwood hardboard which is you know hard density fiberboard rather than this is medium density fiberboard i like to use it for the base plate too but uh i'm out of it so uh, and i forgot to pick up another sheet um, or i would uh i would be making the whole thing not the, not these spacers of course uh, because I mill these down or, or cut them down on table saw to the all uniform length um, Just thicker than of course the uh, the light clock, but I would make the back in the in the bearing plates out of this hardboard uh, For two reasons one it's slick on one side. So the part slides in and out right uh, Against that uh, makes a good bearing surface to, for that part to slide against and two on the outside It's grippy and it helps me uh, Helps me hold on to it real good. It feels comfortable so only the fronts on this set are going to be made out of that and the back set obviously is just uh, that quarter inch plywood so what we need to do now is make our sides and just uh, again just rough cut them out And all we're gonna do now is line these up with the lines that we made. And now that bearing will ride against these and cut out our center part perfectly. So we'll put our CA towards the outside. We don't want CA getting in the center at all. squirt and then line our piece up with our line. I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn that dust collector on. Again, doesn't have to be exact. It's just providing a, a place for that bearing. As a matter of fact, you can see that this one's even got a space there. It doesn't matter at all because that bearing will never know that cracks there. All right, now we want a piece of our spacer that will go in here. And as a matter of fact, let's cut this. Let's clean that up just a little bit. Let's make that a little easier to deal with. So we need a piece of spacer that will fit See, it needs to go from spacer to spacer. So it needs to come just about all the way over here. that piece needs to slide in there I'm going to take a piece of sandpaper and just sand that a little bit thinner than the other spacers perfect all right and now 
now we'll take a piece of this cardboard, cut it to just about exactly the right length because we want this one to be snug. of MDF here. Make sure we're pushed in good and tight. And we want to drill it back here, not on top of our piece. And that'll do it. That locks our piece in while we drill the uh, big hole, take it over to the router. And the router will cut through both pieces and it'll end up looking like this. So let's go do that. Okay, so we're back over to the router table. I've got a 5 8 hole cut through our, our part here uh, so that the router bit can, can come up through that hole and double check our bearing height and, and we are good. I can't emphasize how important it is to keep checking that bearing height because we go from different thickness parts and if you're not careful, uh, you'll you'll eat up the inside of your part if you're not double checking that bearing height. So um, it, I, I do it from time to time. Uh, as much as I know to do it, I, I will still get in a hurry and forget. So uh, I can't emphasize enough, keep checking that bearing height. So uh, our part's locked down, uh, double check everything. We've got the vacuum on. <laughs> So pull our pin out, pull the keeper out of the way, and there is our part. Well, that looks nice, doesn't it? I like that 3 8 radius. I think the half inch is going to work out perfect for this large one. I'm going to move it down to uh, maybe 3 8 uh, or 5 16 on the smaller parts, but I think former 1 and 2 I'm going to leave large like this. I, I like that. So I'll go ahead and make the other four uh, jigs and then we'll start cutting out all the parts and assemble the fuselage. All right, I've made all five of the little jigs for the formers uh, and they worked out very, very nicely. One of the, the key, I, I think the biggest key to this is not to get too carried away on making these. Again, they don't have to be exact, they don't have to be pretty. They just have to hold that part in there nice and snug. That's the most important part. Uh, and your pin needs to lock it down good. Be careful when you're routing these out. I, I haven't had a problem, but if you're new to routing, uh, again, make sure that bearing height is right and make sure you're grabbing at least a, an eighth inch or so uh, of that bearing guide that runs around the top. If you're a, a little uncomfortable, just make this piece thicker. Uh, or maybe even double it up on, on top. It doesn't make any difference how thick that is. 
remember our, our other guides are uh, at least uh, a quarter or three eighths thick. So uh, I can hold this down pretty snug on the router because I've got many years of, of working with the router. It's not hard. Uh, you just don't want it to get uh, bouncing around in there. Uh, so uh, router tip there. Put these to the side. Uh, I've got uh, I've got our bottom piece sat in the jig here, and I have gone ahead and tacked on uh, formers three, four, and five. Of course, uh, number two will be registered in perfect position by the doubler, so we don't have to worry about that. And uh, former number one won't get installed until after we put the wing tube in, so we can just set that one aside. Uh, and, and the part about number two will make more sense in just a little bit. So I have tacked these in place. Uh, I have installed these formers um, with the sides on before, and, and that worked well, uh, but the sides seem to get in, in the way. And on this occasion, I'm trying something new, and I tacked them in place uh, on the bottom before I'm putting it together. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that it will work out fine. Uh, I think I'm going to like this a lot better, in other words. Now, one of the things that you want to consider, or the thing to consider, is exactly how far forward or back you place this. Remember, we've got uh, about 3 8 7 16 of an inch, a little bit less than a half right there of that stringer that uh, we can slide that back and forth. Well, there is an exact sweet spot where our width of the former matches exactly the width of the bottom plate, and that's where you want to be. So uh, when you're tacking it on, make sure that you get it uh, right in that spot where you can run your finger across there and it's exactly even. Take a, uh, uh, just a small square, uh, and I have used a uh, square block, a block that I have squared up to uh, I know is exactly square. Uh, I've taken, uh, gone through a lot of pains to uh, get this thing exactly square, and I will set it oftentimes uh, right there to act as a square, but it doesn't matter what you use. Uh, and it doesn't have to be dead on 90 degrees. You can be a degree or two off because when we're gluing the sides on, remember it's just tacked on, so we can kind of flex it back and forth a little bit. If you're not exactly 90 degrees, uh, you can pull it into shape. Of course, we don't want anything uh, pulled a long ways because then you will add stress to uh, the plane. It'll be preloaded, in other words. So get it as close to 90 degrees as you can get it, um, and then just tack it with CA in a couple of spots. Uh, I would not uh, get, uh, I, I would avoid the uh, um, temptation to really glue it down tight. One, you may want to pop it off and move it. Uh, but two, when we put this thing together, uh, when we put the box fuselage together, we'll have plenty of time as a full unit to uh, drop CA in, in every little seam that we need to. Uh, so there's no need in, in putting a lot of CA on that right now because it will get CA later. So I have installed all of these and they are perfectly even. Uh, another uh, build method that I'm going to change this time um, is how I install the two three millimeter carbon tubes. I'm using carbon tubes or carbon rods, either one I've used them both. I think the tube is just a little bit lighter. Uh, they're, they're both about the same price, they're pretty cheap. So we want to run a carbon fiber tube all the way up to, uh, in, on this plane, I'm gonna run it all the way up to F2, former number two, so from the back. And there's no need coming all the way to the very back because again, the uh, horizontal stab makes this so durable back here, you're not, it would be overkill. So I'm gonna run that carbon fiber tube from probably an inch or two into where the, the horizontal stab would go all the way up to uh, F2. So, let me grab a uh, rod right quick. You'd think I would have this out already, but let's grab a couple of those. And these are, oops, that one's a rod. Grab a tube. they're both tubes oh that one's a rod too and it doesn't make any difference at all uh, if you use rods or tubes I don't think that it does 
got to make sure we get them both the same. And you can buy these anywhere online. There are so many distributors. I like dealing with uh, um, an organization called windcatcher.com. These are three millimeter tubes and rods. Uh, of course, they don't pay me anything. I don't even know if they appreciate me mentioning that. But I have found that they are uh, um, very easy to deal with. And the rods come come pretty quickly. And they're very straight, which is a, a big plus for us. So, uh, like I said, I have installed these a couple of different ways. I have used a long drill bit to uh, drill from the back and drill a small notch in the corner of each of these after I've assembled it. That works okay, um, but it's a, a little cumbersome getting that long drill bit in there and, and you always run the risk of uh, popping one of these things off with a drill bit if the drill bit catches. So this time, I'm gonna try something uh, different and actually use my Dremel to Dremel out a little uh, notch right there that I can slide that carbon fiber tube in once I get the sides on and everything tacked in place. So uh, again, that'll make a little more sense when we get there, but let's see how this works. Uh, I just have a, uh, a regular cutter. This one happens to be a diamond cutter, but a, a uh, fiber cutter would work fine too. I, whenever I am cutting anything that has CA on it, I like to run a, a shop vac or uh, in this case, the dust collector there. Make sure we're cut off everywhere else. Just so that I'm not bringing in, breathing in that CA dust. Oh, I like that. That is a uh, much easier process than the, uh, the process I was using before. So let's measure how long that carbon fiber tube needs to be. Since we're at that point where we have everything sitting in the jig. And we're going to come all the way up and into former number two and we want to come uh, let's come to about there and as luck would have it we're not going to be able to get two out of uh, one rod that would be really nice uh, but we will always use uh, short pieces of carbon rod on something else so we won't waste it Oh, I like that. It's gonna work out real nicely. So we need to notch this piece here. definitely easier than the way that I was doing it so there we go I'll notch out the other side and uh, get that piece of carbon fiber cut to the right length actually this is the one I 
Now another tip about using these uh, wedges for the sides right here. I have found that if you just sharpen one of these wedges with a uh, piece of sandpaper, take just a few seconds, it will slide even further up in there and help hold this side exactly flush against the bottom down there. Again, you wanna make sure that your bottom part is pushed all the way down uh, before you push that in and squeeze everything into place. And then just, you don't have to sharpen the next ones. Uh, just push that in there and it, it stacks up rather nicely and holds everything in place past that bend. So these wedges are actually holding it nice and tight back to about right here. And from here back, I can get my fingers in there and hold that, hold that nicely. And as long as we're registered up, as long as our bottom is flat and we are registered up against this, we'll be 90 degrees. So we don't have to worry about building any twist into our uh, fuselage there. But it is very important that you make sure you push that former down, push the bottom down when you tack that in place. So uh, we're ready to do that. Let me make sure I can get this carbon rod put in there. And it does go in place rather nicely. So I'm gonna pull the carbon rod out uh, while I'm tacking, tacking this in place because I want to be able to see that seam down at the bottom to make sure that it is completely sealed up while I'm tacking this. So uh, everything looks good. We're registered in our right places. We've got our bottom pinned in in both spots. We're pushed all the way to the front on both of these. Everything looks nice and 90 degrees. Triple check everything before we start tacking it together. And the first thing that I like to do is go ahead and slide former number two into place. Make sure it looks good. We've got our eighth inch here and we have double checked the top and the top fits on there very, very nicely, all the way back. So that all looks good. So let's go ahead and start tacking this in place. And we'll put some CA across the bottom. All right, so I have tacked um, all four of the, uh, the aft formers in place, and I've sat our top part in, and it, it fits very, very nicely. All of our stringers line up exactly. Uh, of course, we're lined up at the back, so we know our distance is right, and I've taken a pin and marked where the rear edge of former number two comes to. And remember there's the doubler up here, so we need to notch out a, uh, a section right there for that doubler to fit. Because I'm still not exactly sure how far forward I want this to come. If I cut this off even with the, the uh, forward edge of that former, you could certainly do that and the two would come together uh, and, and make that nice transition there. But I found that I like for the top to overhang that former uh, at least by about a quarter of an inch. And that gives me room for um, the hatch to come down in the, the canopy hatch to come down and sit very nicely and gives me something to uh, sit on there 
so I like at least a quarter of an inch overhang. That's why we cut this piece longer than we need it, because we can always cut it off uh, very easily. You, you can cut it with a, a bandsaw or Dremel or whatever you want to do. Um, so I think I'm going to cut that off probably about three eighths of an inch past that former and then put a notch right there so that the doubler can sit. So let me do that right quick. All right, so I've cut our piece off. I've cut probably a, a quarter of an inch off of it and I cut what I think are, are what looks like about eight inch notches on either side. It's not absolutely critical. It's just the, the closer you get them to matching. Ooh, that looks perfect. The closer you get them to matching uh, the one eighth light ply, the, the cleaner it's gonna look. Uh, now, if we notice here, I don't know if you can see from the camera, uh, we really have to pull that side in to, to uh, meet that because we don't have our wedges down there, right? Uh, and one thing that will help us kind of make that transition, if you uh, remember when we uh, cut our template for the top, it goes straight and then makes a, a sharp angle there where the light ply doesn't like to bend at that sharp angle. So just two or three, doesn't take much at all. Uh, it's about that right there. Two or three swipes with the uh, sanding block. Don't go much at all because uh, you don't want to change that shape because ultimately we're going to put the turtle deck on there and the turtle deck will be uh, uh, following that contour. So just uh, two or three swipes made that look so much nicer. See how that closed up very, very nicely there? So I will go uh, grab some clamps right quick and come back and we will start tacking this rascal together. Make sure you don't push these down. I'm, I'm just putting pressure on the, the uh, formers themselves, not in the center, so you don't want to bow it. All right, now let's start putting our clamps on. You can see that pulls that, that uh, seam up nice and tight. Get it perfectly aligned and just load it up with clamps. All these little clamps remind me of that barrel of monkeys that we used to get uh, as kids back in the 70s. Uh, they're just little plastic clamps, uh, nothing special about them. They're, they're kind of cheap. You can get them on Amazon or wherever. They're about three and a half inches long. Uh, I don't see anything printed on them to tell me exactly what size they are. I'll try to go back uh, through my history, in my order history, and find out exactly where they are and, and provide a link below. Uh, they're pretty invaluable for the kind of stuff that I'm doing here. All right, looks like we've got it locked in place. Very gently, we're gonna take it out so that our clamps don't pop all over the place. And then we'll just start dropping CA on that joint right there. Gluing all of these corners up can get kind of tedious, so let's zoom right through this. Uh, what I like to do is put uh, a couple of drops, maybe a half inch, maybe three quarters of an inch uh, apart from each other and then tilt the fuselage up and, and you can watch it run and, and wick itself into that corner real good. Again, make sure that you don't put uh, CA on the bottom corner. Uh, we're going to do that later uh, when we put the carbon fiber tubes in. So. Pretty straightforward, just make sure that uh, you take your time and, and get all of these corners glued up good. All right, that ought to do it. All right, let's slide our little carbon rubber, carbon fiber tube in. It should go in fairly easy.
And look at that. That was much nicer than the, the uh, original way to install that. And now I'll just take a few uh, a few drops of CA, uh, probably a half inch apart or so, just like a, you saw me do on the, uh, the actual corners, and hold it up and, and let it wick in and around that carbon fiber tube. So I'll put a drop on the bottom of the tube, drop on the top, and move down about half to three quarters of an inch and do the same thing again. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to where you can see that nice in there. It looks pretty good. And you can see where it went up into that former number two very nicely. It's a nice fit. Uh, and I think that it adds a good bit of rigidity. It, it's already rigid. I think it adds a, a good bit of strength back there. Again, probably overkill for a, a regular sport flying, but uh, that bit of carbon fiber and that little bit of extra CA uh, doesn't bother me So as far as weight goes. All right, so we'll move on to the, uh, the next video and finish the fuselage. Wow, so that was a, uh, a pretty long video, uh, probably about two hours or so, I'd guess. I hadn't looked at the exact numbers, but uh, I hope you found it informative, and the next uh, video in line, video number three in this series, will be out um, by the time you get through watching this anyway. It's already filmed and, and just needs finished and edited. So I hope that you uh, liked it. If so, hit the like button and, and subscribe, of course, and uh, I'll see you in just a bit for the next episode.